Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Good evening, everybody. Warm welcome. Welcome in the Bali. Welcome to the Night of Dictatorship, also called the Nacht van de Dictatuur. Um, I'm going to speak English in this introduction because the first part of our night is going to be in English, so I thought that would be most convenient. Um, my name is Tim Wagenmakers, I'm program editor at the Bali, and tonight um, is one of those nights actually that I'm really happy to be here because um, I think We've presented a program that combines, well, five people that I think, that I respect highly, that I truly think that they're worth listening to. As you can see, we have a small, um, I don't know the English word, block schema, a schedule of blocks. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to start, uh, as you might already see on the website, with Jamie Bartlett, who's going to speak with Eva de Valk. I'll introduce them later a bit more thorough. Then we have a short break, and at 9.15, we're going to talk with Jenny on Holtland about the situation in Poland and Hungary. That part is the only part that's going to be in Dutch. So if you only understand English, um, uh, too bad, but not so bad because we have an amazing bar. Uh, and I would really advise you to then take a beer and enjoy yourself a little bit because at 10.15, there's going to be a very special conversation that I'm really proud of. Last year, we had someone that you might call a journalistic hero. He's called Hussam from Raqqa's being slaughtered silently. And when ISIS occupied Raqqa, he and a group of, well, uh, uh, colleagues and friends tried to get independent news out of there uh, with great sacrifice because they had to flee the country. And even now in Europe, their situation is not safe. And we're going to speak with him and Brenda Stoter Boskolo, a Dutch journalist, about the situation and about how things are going for him now. But also, um, as you know, about the situation in Syria, because, well, to be honest, this night of dictatorship somehow got some momentum this week with all the news that's what's going on. We're going to talk about Hungary when just in the European Parliament they passed uh, uh, a vote to start an Article 7 procedure. And with Syria we just found out that the Dutch government might be funding some people that they didn't want to fund. So we have enough to talk about. Um, but first we're going to talk about the internet. Tonight is a night we're going to talk about forces that undermine democracy, um, tendencies, so not just pure dictatorship, but, well, if you see it as a skill, things that are going in a way that might be worrying or not. Um, and I'm really happy because we're going to talk, we're going to listen to Jamie Bartlett, who flew here to tell his story about uh, his new book, People vs. Tech, that came out in April, and is actually a warning about how technology undermines democracy. We had the pleasure of hosting him here three years ago with, when he wrote his book, uh, The Dark Net, which is also really um, an eye-opener, I think. So we're going to listen to him, and then afterwards he's going to engage in a conversation with Eva de Valk. She writes for NSC Handelsblad about technology, but she also was a correspondent in Silicon Valley. She wrote a book that I really enjoyed. I think you can still find it, because I think it's still as relevant as it was for five years ago when you wrote it. It's called Silicon Valley after the name and after the place, so that makes sense, I guess. Um, and we're going to listen to that, and at the end of that there will be room for two or three questions from the audience, so already think about your questions. Um, also, I'd like to remind you that at 10.15 you can choose, because we also have a documentary in the film hall, which is just there, and which uh, is called The Cleaners, about Facebook and the backside of it, how people actually have to moderate the comments that are being placed there. Um, but enough about the program, let's just start. 
Um, I'm really happy he's here. He's actually having a whole lecture tour coming from Groningen tomorrow, going to The Hague, Rotterdam, Utrecht. Um, and I think everyone, uh, everywhere it's already sold out. So I think you struck a chord there. So we're really curious how it's going. Give him a warm welcome, uh, Jamie Bartlett. Thank you, thank you, thanks so much. Uh, Tim, thanks to Pro Demos and Dibali for organizing this. It's a real honor to, to do a lecture tour. In fact, it's the first time I've ever done a lecture tour. And incredibly, I've lost my voice. Alanis Morissette, eat your heart out. How about that? Um, so I'll probably be occasionally swigging on some ginger tea. I might even overdose on it. I've had about five glasses already. It's really good, especially actually, to be in the Netherlands because this really was the country where I first was introduced to computers. My dad was a computer programmer, and in 1988-89, I lived in Zeist uh, because he worked. I, I even spoke Dutch. I've forgotten it all now. Um, he worked for Apple Macintosh when the company was at its lowest ebb. He, st he said to me, son, Apple Macintosh is never going to amount to anything. It's a terrible company. One of the things that he had was a huge IBM machine, an enormous mainframe computer. One of these computers that back in the 1980s took up the whole of his study. And it was work. It was his study with the kids, me, my brother, my sister. We didn't really get involved. But the computer knew all about us because my father's a strange disciplinarian. And he programmed his computer to write a schedule. This was all these computers could do back then to write a schedule of all the chores that we children had to do. Oh, draw the curtains, tidy your bedroom, take your shoes off, do the washing up. And every day he would print this damn thing out and walk around and check to see whether we'd done each task. And if we didn't do the task, he would deduct 10 pence from our pocket money. Uh, yeah, ah, oh, thank you. Um, about six months later, both me and my brother owed my father about 150 pounds. <laughs> and I think from that very young age, I had a sense that maybe computers aren't always liberating. Maybe computers aren't always there to make your life better and easier. Maybe it depends on who owns them. Maybe it depends on the uses to which they're put. Maybe it allows new forms of surveillance and control that weren't possible before. And obviously now this, I mean, these were my childish reflections, but now this is something that many of us are worried about. And I take it one of the reasons that you're here is because you've been watching the news with alarm about Russian bots, about Cambridge Analytica, about cryptocurrencies, about artificial intelligence, all these incredible things that seem to be happening. My contention, which I'm going to argue tonight, is that all of those stories, journalists are getting most of them wrong. They're seeing them in isolation. They're seeing them as individual stories. What they're not doing is explaining that they're all part of the same bigger story which is that we have an old analog democracy that was built up at a very particular time and place according to a very particular set of rules and norms. And we suddenly have a brand new technology, a digital technology that just does not play by the same rules. Now, all of us, I think, are being slightly blinded by digital technology because we can see its very obvious benefits. We can see that it's helpful for democracy in the sense that it allows us to speak our mind, to have a platform. But democracy is more than that. It's a set of institutions and cultures and norms, expectations that are often quite boring. We don't really talk about them very much, but they are slowly being eroded gradually, imperceptibly. And I'm not going to suggest that democracy is going to collapse overnight. What instead is happening, I think, is that those boring institutions of democracy are being eroded and more and more people will start to turn away from democracy entirely and think this system doesn't really work very well anymore. That's the task and that's the challenge. So I'll give you a couple of stories where I think people have got this wrong. 
And let's start with my dear friend, arch Bond villain, Alexander Nix. I mean, with a face and a name like that, it was inevitable that this man would become part of a huge horror story. Alexander Nix, CEO of Cambridge Analytica. You've probably heard of this company. They worked for the Trump campaign. They worked all around the world. And the story is that Cambridge Analytica, a data analytics firm based in London, managed to sway the minds of millions of Americans with stolen data from Facebook by giving them personalized adverts that convinced them to vote for Donald Trump. I don't know if anyone works in digital advertising, but my goodness me, if it only were that easy to do, it's really not that easy. I think the story here is a lot of liberal people have found it far easier to blame Alexander Nix than they have to ask harder questions of their own candidate. And they refuse to understand why so many people could have voted for Donald Trump. The truth about this story with Cambridge Analytica is that they were doing what pretty much everybody else is doing. No real magic tricks. They took 5,000 data points that they legally acquired from this enormous industry of data brokers that exists out there. Your credit card records, whether you own a gun or not, what car you drive, magazines you subscribe to, websites you've been visiting. There's this whole industry selling this stuff. And from that, they built a profile of 200 million Americans with those 5,000 data points. They then worked with the Republican Party to match up their data set with the Republican Party's voter data set to try to figure out who are the people that might be persuaded to vote for Trump and what do they care about. They found 11 million or so people that they called persuadables. These are the possible people we think we can swing to our side. And about six weeks into the campaign, they said to Brad Pascal, who was running the Trump team, we think we have enough data points, enough persuadables, that we can win Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And everyone said, no, it's impossible. That's Clinton territory. But they said the data suggests that we can. And so they shifted loads of their budget into those three states. They spent $80 million on targeted Facebook adverts aimed at those 11 million people and relentlessly bombarded them with adverts to get them to vote. Now, you can never say what truly swings an election one way or the other. Lots of factors. But when the results came in, Trump had won Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan by less than one percentage point. He won Wisconsin by 11,000 votes. A later analysis by Facebook found that these guys were significantly better than Clinton at running adverts on their platform. They reached more people. They persuaded more people to do stuff. So I think they did have a huge role in swinging the election for Trump, but doing things that everybody else is doing. They just did them better. And this, I think, is more worrying because this is the trend of politics. Politics is now becoming a question, or elections at least, are becoming more like a data science. Think about where we will be in 10 or 15 years' time. All of us are now spewing out, well, not all of us yet, but more and more of us are spewing out all sorts of new types of data. Our baby monitors, our smart fridges, our smart TVs, our smart cars, our smart coffee machines. Why people buy smart coffee machines is beyond me. They're going to get hacked by the Russians, and you're going to have to pay Bitcoin every time you want a coffee in the morning. Trust me, do not get one. All of this data is also going to be captured. Of course it is. And it's going to be used to build models about you, to work out what time you eat. Oh, and guess what? We figured out that when you eat, just before you eat, you eat at 6 p.m. We've looked at your Facebook posts, and at 5 p.m. you start using more emotional language because you're hungry. We also know that it just so happens that people who are angry are more open to hard on law and order candidates. So at 5.35, you start getting personalized adverts through your fridge from the tough on law and order candidate, which sounds ridiculous, but this is what is going to happen. And what worries me is that this is not about one election or another being won or lost. This is actually about a 
completely different way of doing elections, where politics is no longer about the big debate of the day that we thrash out in public. It's about identifying the one thing that each of you individually cares about and hammering you with that. In 10 years time, each person will receive a completely different message from the person next to them, from the same candidate. How do you hold a politician accountable when everyone's getting a different message? How does a regulator who is trying to stay on top of this figure out what messages people are getting and that they're true if they're only seen by that one person? In the EU referendum, it's recently been revealed that adverts on Facebook were being sent out to potential voters saying that the EU was trying to stop British people from drinking cups of tea. No wonder they lost this, you know. I'm surprised it was only 52-48, to be honest. So this is a real problem, and I think it's those kinds of longer-term problems that we should be thinking about. These are the slow ways that our democracy is being eroded. Not with a bang, not with the radios being taken over by the soldiers, but by a slow erosion of the institutions that we have built up that make representative democracy actually work. The book is called The People vs. Tech, How the Internet is Killing Democracy. I told Random House, I wanted it to be called How Modern Liberal Representative Democracy is Being Undermined by the Internet as Currently Constructed. And um, they rejected that one. So it's a little bit more extreme. Right, that's story number one. One of the other stories that I think people are getting slightly confused is about people like this. This is Tommy Robinson, leader of the far-right English Defence League. Well, he's actually no longer the leader of that, but he set it up. And there's many of these far-right groups, these populist movements that are increasingly popular all across the world. And the story is at the moment that so, social media has been a boon to these groups. They have exploited it to get their message of hate and anger out there. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time with Tommy Robinson. I, I shadowed him for six months as he went across Europe trying to set up his movement. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting, people assume that he just surrounds himself with fake news, conspiracy theories. I'm afraid it's rather more complicated than that. Yes, he does that a little bit, but what he also does is surrounds himself with cherry-picked true news, actual stories of actual problems that corroborate the worldview of Tommy Robinson, which is to say there is a war between Islam and the West. Liberals know about it, but they're too afraid to admit it. I mean, you know about this, obviously. This is not unfamiliar in this country either. I won't name any names. But the point is that he is able now to identify, to find, to be sent and share dozens of stories each day that confirm his worldview and that are true stories from the BBC, from CNN. Oh, there's been a crime wave here and a refugee was committed a crime at this. A thousand people associated with ISIS are coming into Europe. There was a child sexual abuse scandal that happened in the north of England and the police wouldn't investigate it because they were nervous about cultural sensitivities. True stories. One-sided stories. Cherry-picked stories. Never looking at the good stuff that's going on. But it doesn't matter for him because he's able to collect them all together and then relentlessly push out a stream of true stories that corroborate that worldview. And this is harder to deal with because this is the omission of some truths, not simply fake news. And the reason this is a problem, or one reason it's a problem, is that we are all guilty in some senses of doing this. Many of us now surround ourselves with carefully selected true stories. Many of us now create realities of our own. And I don't think that the problem is that populists are good at using social media. I think that social media is making all of us into populists in a small, subtle sense. It's turning all of us somehow in, almost into fascists in our style of politics, not in our ideology. One of the aspects of fascism that has been written about a great deal is the willingness and ability to act without reflection. Alberto Eco wrote about this beautifully in an essay about fascism. 
He said that for the fascist, action is beautiful in and of itself because reflection and thought and consideration, well, heaven forbid, that might make you reconsider. You might even be reasonable if you do such a thing. Unfortunately, the way that social media is set up is not to allow for such reflection. And this is based on a fundamental misconception made in the 90s about how humans work. The techno-optimists of the day said that once we're all connected, once we have access to each other's ideas, once we have access to all the world's information, we will become nicer, we will become kinder, we will become more reasonable and our politics will be wiser. The idea being that we'd never be misinformed anymore. What they didn't really figure out though, was that humans don't think like that. When you are completely overwhelmed with information, as we are, with blogs and facts and charts and counter charts, you really can only deal with this at quite an emotional level. You can really only deal with this immediately, quickly, without reflection. This is a huge problem. And it's one that we are all guilty of. This is not about taking sides. I'm not saying the left is worse than the right or the right is worse than the left. Rather that we are all being infected with this. And Hannah Arendt, when she wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism, it was obviously a long time ago, it was in the 1950s, but she talked about the dangers of having a population that is just sort of floating around like corks on a stormy sea, not really sure what to believe, confronted constantly with contradictory information. Why? Because that is the time that a powerful, strong leader steps in and says, I will bring order to this chaos. I can fix all of these problems easily for you. Trust me. This is the origins, I think, of our kind of tribal politics. You're on my side or you're against me. And this is the way much of our politics seems to be going. And um, this is like what I think a lot of the descriptions about echo chambers get completely wrong. The idea that we're stuck in these silos of information and we don't listen to anybody else. I go online, I see other views all the time. I just don't like any of them. I think they're all dangerous because I'm not engaging with them properly because I don't have the time to. It's too difficult, there's too much. This, by the way, is why I think the populists of this world are far more in tune with the culture of the day. Anyone remember you had to go and when you used to get your photographs developed and you had to wait like a week and you paid money for it and they were always rubbish as well. Young people must think this was mad. Why were you doing this? Politics is still that. The world has moved on to Instagram where it's all immediate, but the populists are more like the Instagram of, pop, of politics. It's, they suit the technology of the day and the mainstream parties are not. Final thing, I know I haven't got so much time, but um, we've all heard about this great artificial intelligence revolution coming. It's another story the journalists are getting wrong. They're talking about the either Hollywood style artificial intelligence robots that are going to go sentient and they're going to go rogue and I don't know what they're going to do, but like in the movies, they might turn on us. Or that there'll be no more jobs left in the future. We're going to be replaced. I think this is the completely the wrong way of thinking about this. I don't think sentience is a completely different subject. There will be jobs. We just can't imagine them yet. We're very good at knowing the ones we're going to lose. We can't imagine the ones we haven't yet invented. The real question is whether the shape of the new economy in the future, which depends more on smart machines and software, is that going to drive greater inequality? Are the people that can use this stuff going to benefit greatly and everybody else that can't going to suffer? Is it going to hollow out our economies and drive a new level of inequality that we've not seen before? This is the question we should be thinking about now. About a year ago, I was in Silicon Valley and I went 100 miles on a self-driving truck in Florida, actually. It's amazing. I mean, in Florida, all the roads are dead straight, so it's kind of easy. But it was very interesting to do. And I would always speak to the people who were building this technology. And I'd say to them, you're going to disrupt the trucking sector. You know, one day we'll have self-driving trucks. What are the people, the men in their 50s, for whom trucking is a really good job, 
one of the best jobs you can get if you left school at 18 without qualifications. What are they going to do? What jobs are they going to get? And they would always say the same thing to me, which is those people should retrain as robotic specialists or machine learning engineers. And I just think that's mad. That's never going to happen. It's completely unrealistic. So that's the question we have to ask. Now let me show you a quote. I'm not sure if you can read it, so I'll quickly read it. Machines will take care of more and more of the simpler tasks so that there will be an increasing surplus of human workers at the lower levels of ability. Technolo technology advances with great rapidity and threatens freedom at many different points at the same time, increasing dependence of individuals on large organizations, propaganda and other psychological techniques, invasion of privacy through surveillance devices and computers, etc. Now, this was written in 1995 by this guy here. The Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, killed three people, sent letter bombs to a series of different places all over America, was finally caught serving life sentences at the moment. The last of the neo-Luddites, the last of the people that smashed these machines up. Now, when he wrote this in the 90s, it sounded like madness. People didn't have computers apart from my dad. Um, but it now reads like a kind of editorial in the Guardian or New York Times newspaper. Everyone's saying this stuff. What I fear is that if people start to see these technologies as a tool of oppression, like my dad's thing, they will start to smash them up. They will start to destroy them. Forget about Uber drivers in, in Paris. I mean, I don't know what they're, French aren't going to go for this, are they? What they are going to do, however, is not simply stand by to watch their industry being disrupted. What they will do is sabotage. They'll draw, this is a self-driving car that can't move anywhere because someone's drawn a stop sign all the way around it. You're going to have Luddites out on the streets playing around with spray paint to try to mess up these systems. And that's a great shame, because all the wonderful productivity benefits that's going to come from this great technological revolution will be lost. So there are my three stories. And where does it leave us? Well, where I think it leaves us is my fear is a slow, gradual erosion that we can already see. It's already documented in people's confidence in democracy as a system that actually works. I'm not saying democracy is perfect. It's like Winston Churchill said, the worst type of government apart from all the others. But the slow erosion of trust in democracy as a system that works and people gradually start to turn to alternatives. Alternatives, maybe we'll still have elections, we'll still have plebiscites, we'll still have members of parliament. But people will be more and more open to the authoritarians of the world who promise to save us from these machines or who promise to run society smoothly and calmly with this technology so they can guarantee jobs and guarantee stability and fight crime through great surveillance techniques like in China or in Singapore. And these are the alternatives that now loom in front of us. We thought there were no alternatives to democracy. But there are, and these are they. And unfortunately, all of us are somehow complicit. There's a very real possibility that if these systems, if these new kind of authoritarian systems using technology were able to deliver jobs and stability and growth, I think lots of people would be perfectly happy for that. I think people would vote for that. But once we voted for it, can we go back? The problem is we are all complicit because we are building this system with our data, with our swipes, with our shares, with our willingness to trade everything for convenience. That's bad news. But the good news is it also means that we can make different decisions about how we live our lives online. And if we start to do that now, we can avert some of these terrible futures. And on that depressing note, I'll stop and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Jamie. Please sit down. Thanks so much for your three very uh,
compelling stories. Uh, thanks so much also for not speaking all day. So you still have some <laughs> of your voice left. Um, very happy with that. Uh, and I'll start now with about 20 minutes of interview. And then after that, there's uh, about 10 minutes for questions. So please think about your questions and I'll get back to you in about 20 minutes. But now If it's a really hard question, my voice might suddenly um, go mysteriously. Too, too bad, too bad. <laughs> well, don't make them too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, you have to talk to me. So <laughs> let's uh, start. And I wanted to um, start with something you wrote in your preface. Um, Over the years, my optimism drifted into realism, then morphed into ner nervousness. Now it's approaching mild panic. You reveal that you were a tech optimist before. You wouldn't figure that uh, after this uh, lecture. Um, can you tell me what happened? What were the key events over the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years yeah. that changed your perception of L technology? Less, less, less time. I mean, I think like a lot of people, 2009, 2011 especially, were real high points. Thinking that this technology in the Arab Spring, Occupy movement, it's amazing, it's democratizing somehow just by default because it gives people a platform and a voice. And this is why I said at the beginning, that has blinded us to the fact that these techniques and tools can very easily be co-opted. That the powerful who have all the assets find it very easy to use them in ways that benefit them. And so after 2011, slowly and gradually, you could see both the Occupy movement not delivering on what they, yeah, or struggling to turn a platform into a m proper movement of government. Yeah. And of course, what happened- WikiLeaks. In the, exactly, yeah. And then I think that um, over the years, it was that sort of accumulation of different stories. And I kept seeing, you know, there's a thing of I illegal pornography on the dark now, which I studied a, a lot in that book that you can't seem to get rid of. There's these internet trolls that are doing something. There's this cryptocurrency that's causing a problem. There's these Russian um, troll farms in St. Petersburg. There is Cambridge Analytica. And I just, I suddenly had this realization that these are no longer just a series of unfortunate, isolated stories. Something much deeper is going on. And I studied history and everyone would say, oh, it's like the Industrial Revolution. Things were bad for a while, but, you know, look how much better we all are. Or the printing press. Aren't you glad that happened? And I thought back to my studies and I thought, yeah, that's true. But when both of those things were invented, it created so much short term damage to people, to their ways of life. And it took them a long time to reconfigure and rebalance. And I kind of feel like that is probably where we are now. And do you think we need a lot of time to rebalance? Or are we just basically in doomed. all the mess, doomed? <laughs> What's amazing is that even since that book was published, um, and it's not because of that book, it's because of other things, I feel like the mood has changed surprisingly quickly. I think if I'd been invited to do this three years ago, it would have been really quite controversial. Like technology and democracy, I mean, they're obviously great. What's the problem? Now more and more people, I think, are sort of realizing that there's a problem. And the Cambridge Analytica story has really raised awareness. I mean, I think they've done more for internet privacy than anyone else alive. The European Union is now really taking this on quite seriously. Lots of journalists have now declared war on Google and Facebook, essentially. So the mood has changed extremely. For real, for real. That's actually my next question, because the tech clash has, is yeah. big. And in my opinion, sometimes it's a bit too big, and we might be like losing some of the good things. I mean, since you were a tech optimist before, you know all the arguments like um, how technology can have a positive impact on society and democracy as well. So more transparency, better involved and informed citizens. Are um, we better informed? I'm not sure that we are. It's one of the things, but let me, we, just, just let, me, yeah. let me continue my question. So what I was wondering, did all your expectations you might have had once of technology, did they just evaporate or do you still think technology might offer some opportunities? Yes, um, it didn't all evaporate. It's, it's not that I don't see the benefits. It's more that I prefer to see it in the big aggregate. And like I said, it's more about the way that it's currently set up and constituted. 
One of the things, for example, is phone addiction. I mean, I don't see it as much here because I think you'd be run over by a cyclist very quickly. But in the UK, everyone walks around staring at their phone and they're banging into each other. It's like a zombie town. And that, of course, is built into the underlying incentives of the social media platforms because they're essentially advertising companies. So they want to keep you online as long as possible. So they're as addictive as possible. It doesn't have to be like that, though. You could still have social media that was funded differently. And then it wouldn't be designed to be so addictive. And I think there's a real problem here because the attention span of many countries, I think, has diminished by about 20 percent in the last three four years, but it can be redesigned and reconfigured. So it's more about how we're designing these things, how we're regulating them. And I think we just got to be a lot more aggressive and forward thinking about how we do that. Have you seen some interesting examples lately where you thought, hey, but this is a smart invention that might actually help democracy? Yeah, book. It's called a book. <laughs> <laughs> Your own book. <laughs> They're still out there. Um, a lot of the, a lot of, okay, so a lot of, there is a lot of development. You've probably seen it too. A lot of development in alternative technologies now. Yeah. yeah. Decentralized systems, default encrypted systems, apps that uh, are built to let you not check your phone every five seconds by constantly, essentially like a piggy bank, blocking you from checking it. Yeah, um, or someone who, uh, like Medium, that is like designed for a longer form online content. Exactly, like exactly. And I mean, and, and also search engines that are different, uh, competitors to Uber. But I'm also seeing regulators being more willing to regulate these companies. And I think that is at least half of the battle. But part of the book is also to encourage people to take responsibility themselves. Like every time anyone tries to give up Google because they think they're too powerful, it usually lasts about five minutes because you try a, a different, you try duck, duck, go or Bing or whatever. And then you're like, this is rubbish. I'm going back to Google. Well, I'm afraid we have to, we have to maybe get through that because if no one's ever going to use these platforms, they're never going to get better. They're never going to get bigger. They're never going to be competitors. So I think there's a lot of interesting new tech out there. It's going to be on us to start using it. Otherwise, they'll never grow. Mastodon, an alternative social media platform that's decentralized. There's loads out there. Um, I'm still doubting between two questions. There's so much I'd like to ask. Uh, but uh, in, in my opinion, at some points in your book, you go too far in rejecting technology. And one of the cases where I thought, nah, is where you write about apps for voting advice. Here in the Netherlands, we have Stemweiser and, well, in the UK, you have other forums, and you write, um, we should uh, ditch them all uh, because, <laughs> and this is a sentence from your book, if you hand over your data to an app, why not hand over your vote to an algorithm entirely? And I thought, no, that's not what it's about. It's a form to inform yourself and to compare the different standpoints of different parties. And yeah, I thought um, just, if you reflect on yourself as a technology writer, um, like how can, how can, and I'm a technology writer myself, how can you be critical uh, on worrying mm. developments while not losing potential good sides of technology? Mm. What is, yeah. Yeah, that's what a different, yeah, yeah. That? I mean, and, and I, 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 I did a full 360 on voter apps because um, I helped to build one for my think tank Demos. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. The problem with it was I saw how difficult it was to build it and how much power ultimately was in the hands of the designer. So somebody would say in, on the questionnaire would say, I really support the National Health Service and I have to make a decision how to score that. Well, do I mean, should I give the left wing party? Because the right wing party says they care about the National Health Service. And, and I suddenly realized that you're kind of outsourcing your moral judgment to a system that you don't understand and that someone else is running and controlling. And if you take it to, I mean, I, if you take it to something even like Alexa. Because it, it cannot be perfect. That's no, but it's, but it's more than that. It's like we have to, it's not much to go and inform yourself properly to read about stuff to watch the news rather than just put in some things into an app and be told who you should vote for. 
So, and, and I talk about this kind of moral singularity that if we, if smart machines are getting better and better at making moral judgments and proposals for us, we get less and less good to make moral judgments of our own. And I think it's really important to defend that. And I'm afraid that I think apps like that, not only do they give control to the designer, they make people lazy in their modes of thinking. And we just can't afford to do that. Okay. We agree to disagree, I guess, on this part, because I think, no, I think it's really important that um, it, it's, it's also a tool that can help people to inform themselves. And if you have a bit more faith in citizens, then you have, could believe that they yes, but use I, it like that. Yes, but I mean, I, I love citizens. I love you all dearly. <laughs> I know, however, that we are, we are collectively quite lazy. And I, like... When I get lost and my Google Maps don't work anymore, I can't find my way around because and I used to be able to. And I'm worried that in a weird way, in 10, 20 years time, that's how it will be for moral judgments. So it's not to lose faith in people, but it's to understand that when you're constantly being nudged in one way or another, you begin to not develop the same critical faculties anymore. Yeah, and just in general, I mean, we, of course, we agree that we should always be very, very critical on the tools that we are using but and voting, understanding voting them. Voting is like, it's the one thing that you as citizens really have to think about. And you're going to let an app tell you? I mean, come on. I, I never vote for what, is, what, what my app says, but it's, but it's interesting. And at that, yeah. what? The, the, the 50 plus party, I should always vote for them. I think, no, I'm not going to vote for them, but why did I end up here? It's still, it's, it can be interesting. But, but can I say one quick thing? Like yes, what sure. worries me is the emergence of personal AI assistance in the home, because the same thing could happen there. Alexa, it's one thing to say, Alexa, order me some milk. And it'll probably come from Whole Foods because they own Whole Foods. But what about when you say, Alexa, tell me the news? What, what news is it going to be? I mean, it's going to be news that Amazon's going to... So there's a sort of danger that when you, you put in non-specific queries to machines, you don't really ever know what you're going to get back, in which case more control goes to them over you. That's my sort of big picture on it. Let's go to another uh, topic you write about, and that is uh, tribalism. Um, you spoke about it in the lecture as well. Um, Winston Churchill said, uh, democracy is the worst form of government except all the others, um, except for all the others. And one of the flaws of modern liberal democracies is that women and minorities are underrepresented. Uh, and through the rise of social media, we have seen uh, new forms of activism like Black Lives Matter, a Me Too movement that really started a discussion about how to create a more inclusive society. And I was wondering, how do you see these movements? Are they new forms of technology-enabled activism, or is it just a new form of tribalism? Uh, I think they're both. And I mean, I talk about, there's sort of, there's, tribe, there's tribes that I like and tribes that I dislike. And I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to blame one side or another. But I see Bernie Sanders supporters, Black Lives Matter, the alt-right, the English Defence League, Jeremy Corbyn fans, PVV, whatever, as a form of tribalism in politics. You can agree with some of them and disagree with some of them. I, but I don't think it is a healthy form of politics when you... You don't think it's contributing to a more inclusive society? Well, I, I, think, yeah, I, think it ca I think it can do that. And again, like, and I say in the book, like, there's the positive aspects coming in here. But it is also contributing to a more um, polarised form of politics. And that's, again, pretty well documented, that politics has become angrier, more emotional, nastier, more polarised. People are less likely to want to get along with each other, to listen to each other. What, what I see as a real trend is you no longer, or, or less and less, you see your opponents not as people with principled differences of opinion, but as evil people, Machiavellians, mm -hmm. stupid idiots, whatever. And that's a real danger because in the yeah. end, politics has to be about compromise at some point. And if you view your opponents in that way, you never compromise with them. You can't because they're evil. And so even the good bits of that, I think, unfortunately, are being, well, they're being weighed down or diminished by the problems that are coming with it. 
Um, just looking. Okay, well, uh, I have one last question and you can give a short answer and then I'll get to you guys here in the audience. Um, and that is because it's um, very specific, it's very interesting for the Dutch situation. Uh, you predict that populist parties will uh, promise more referendums and digital voting. Um, this is very relevant for the Dutch context and how what are your views now on digital voting is that because you just said you should all vote you should go all out should we have more referendums more digital voting should we stick to the one-time voting every four years yeah Could well you... don't speak to me about referendums i mean i'm not in the mood <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> i i think um i, I um for the first time since ancient Greece, it's possible to have a proper digital democracy, a proper direct democracy. And I can see a great buildup of support for that. But unfortunately, I think it's a bad idea. I think what we need to try to do is to improve the state of representative democracy first. And it is interesting that every populist out there does promise direct democracy. And the reason is, is they see that as a way around the corrupt media elite, the corrupt liberal politicians, and straight to the voice of the authentic person. Every populist claims to represent the ordinary man on the street against the evil, powerful establishment. And for them, these direct democracy votes are a way of getting to that. And just looking through history, the politicians that always claim they're for the man on the street against the evil establishment, it never ends well. And they're seeing digital direct democracy as a new means of getting that. So we should stick to traditional voting. We've got to improve preferably. democracy. Yes, we do have to improve how democracy works, but, yeah, okay. but not through loads more referendums. Claire, let me see if there are any questions in the audience. I'll get to you and then to you. Can you say your name and then ask your question? Yes. Oh, and please stand up. Oh, of course. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I had two questions, if that's possible. Okay. Two short questions. The first question is about tribalism. What's your name? My, oh, my name is Giza Magendane. Uh, my first question is about uh, tribalism. I, I wonder, uh, do you see technology as a cause? Uh, or maybe uh, there is something much more behind and that technology might enhance this uh, uh, tribalism you are explaining. Yeah. And uh, the other question is about um, the context of your talk to my ideas about the rich side of the world, maybe the Western uh, uh, developed democracies. Yeah. I wonder, maybe you discuss that in the book, um, how do you apply this to other parts of the world in general? You said this was a short question. <laughs> <laughs> that was my second question. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, so I'll try and be brief because I would like to hear some others too. Yeah, I definitely think it is a cause, but I think tribalism's always been a natural form of politics in a way, but we've built a system to try to prevent that. And I think that digital technology, by overwhelming us, has sort of forced tribalism back out of its box. That's the way that, that, that I see it, because when you are so overwhelmed with information all the time, you have to find your tribe. It's kind of the only way to survive. And you have to find a tribal leader to give you order to that. So this is why we're living in the age of no more deference to politicians. And yet we seem to have these great tribal political leaders um, around. It is mostly about advanced um, Western democracies, most of the book. But some of it does apply. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in India working on this. And there's a lot of the same things going on in India, where Cambridge Analytica also worked, by the way. So I see a lot of these issues actually playing out all over. Let me see, where was, yeah, I saw here, yeah. Oh yeah, hi Emma. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth and um, I think my big question is, when at what point I think are we going to give up this cult of productivity and this idea that this is the thing that's fixing it, particularly you look at such as the most recent job numbers that have come out of the US and wages aren't up and neither is productivity. And is it that we need to let go of this idea that we're gonna get more from all these things and more that we need to start letting go of more of them to get back what we had by making ourselves uncomfortable, by not having, 
the phone isn't going to get us all these great things. It's the knowing it's there when we need it, but still choosing to not look at Google Maps at every single turn. Is how do we go back to finding, knowing we need that discomfort, and really we're not getting anything more out of. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, I, I do think that generally a lot of the answers are not that I propose anyway are not found in technology. Uh, they're going to be found in restructuring our economy. They're going to be found in new forms of ownership, experimenting with new forms of ownership. They're going to be in, I see a lot of parents now absolutely petrified about what to do with their kids and iPads. It's like literally like number one preoccupation for parents, iPads. And they're really worried about how to do this properly. And so there's a growing awareness about that. And part of it, I think, I have to work actively on not checking my phone all the time. It's like fitness or giving up drinking. Like it's a constant battle. But I think that is a duty as a citizen to regain your powers of attention and concentration. So there are things that we can do. The bigger question about productivity is much broader. But in a way, the crisis that I think is coming is going to force us to confront that. There was a question. He, he, OK. Uh, yeah, first that one then. There, sorry. Hi, my name is Justine, and I've spent some uh, time in the Middle East. Hence, I am thinking of um, combat robotics. Um, I haven't read your book yet, so I don't know if you go into that in your book, but I was wondering um, how big and how deep you think the threat is of combat oh robotics and what's a vi um, <laughs> This is so bad. Beef. <laughs> I didn't want to bring it up because I wanted to keep you all in a good mood. Uh, wait, wait. Sorry, my question is a bit long. And part two of the question is, um, and what do you feel, if there's an answer at all, uh, that civilians can do, um, maybe not going into whether or not they have actual real influence in the democratic system, but what could they do to influence um, maybe military decisions? Well, just in the same way that I think citizens looking like they're frustrated and care and they care about all this technological disruption now is what's given politicians, including in the EU, confidence to be bold in the way they deal with it. Because 10 years ago, they, politicians thought that we all loved this to death, so they wouldn't say anything bad about it. Whereas now you can see that the mood has changed with the public and the mood is changing with the politicians. Because there's political capital to be had in taking a tough line on this which is really positive, and the same thing is going to have to apply to the use of artificial intelligence in warfare. This is, not just about, this is not just about killer drones, but that is a serious issue that has to be regulated. It's also about the use of powerful AI for cyber attacks, for example. We are, I don't know how we do it, but we are going to have to come up with a similar way that we've done with nuclear proliferation treaties. It's because these technologies are really, really powerful. You are soon going to have very small drones that will have facial recognition technology attached to them and tiny explosives in them. I mean, you can imagine what could happen there. And you can imagine the future evolution of terrorist use of these sorts of technologies. So it's important that governments don't set a bad example by developing this and using it all the time because it will then spread out into civilian use and policing use. How can you do it? I mean, again, lobby, talk about it, complain, whinge, bitch, get out there and moan, because otherwise this will just keep developing. I can take one question. OK, just pick out one. Sorry, I'll keep the microphone. Can you say your name first? My name is Menno Sude, and I was wondering if you could reinvent the internet with the knowledge you have now, what would be different? <clears throat> um, if I could, it, uh, I'd, well, I'd probably just blow it up. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, of course I wouldn't. I, the, 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 uh, the very first thing that I would, would do would be to, it would have been hard at the time, but it, it would have been to make people pay for stuff. It came from a very positive place. The idea that all this information should be free because we want it to be democratized. We don't want to charge a subscription to our newspapers. We don't want to charge anything to use the search engine. We don't want to charge anything for social media platform use. 
And that came from a positive position of democratizing these technologies. The problem was that then they had this issue, which is how do we pay for all our server space and our engineers and our security? Let's run adverts against it. And that just started off this whole industrial scale data collection, this constant need to distract you by getting you switched on. The Cambridge Analytica is ultimately a result of that decision because that is the model on which these platforms are based. That was the single best hopeful but worst idea that they had. And it's also inculcated in all of us that we shouldn't have to pay for our news anymore. We can just get it all for free, which is what's crippling a lot of the world's media. So if I could go back, it would be to say, I know people are going to whinge. Trust me in the long run, it's better to make people pay for it. Thanks so much for your answer, because I think this is a great way to end, because I can actually find a positive note here. Since we are seeing lots of subscription services uh, on the rise at the moment, because actually people do see that if they want to have high quality news, they have to pay for it. And if they want to protect their privacy, they have to pay for it. So maybe <laughs> there is a positive yeah. um, like thing to look forward to. Uh, I know that there were more questions. Uh, we will have a break right now. You can maybe like either talk to each other or uh, walk over to Jamie, who will maybe join the break if you can yes. still. Yes, of course. Um, have that. We uh, will have a break until uh, nine uh, fifteen. Then we'll all be back here. So it will be a brief break. Please be back on time because we'll continue the program. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>